The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Tell Life Limited, ABN 7005 0109 450, AFSL 2378 48, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. My name is Sasha Lutkovsky and I'm a former insurance advisor of 15 years and CEO of The Sale Agency, a firm dedicated to helping advisors grow their businesses. This series is all about insurance, exploring the start to end process of putting a policy in place all the way through to claim time. I'm joined by five experts who share their knowledge and insights and a few stories along the way. So let's get started. This podcast series is brought to you by leading Australian life insurer, TAL. TAL is committed to partnering with advisors to protect the financial well-being of their clients, now and into the future. TAL's accelerated protection products ensure your clients have access to cover options that are suited to their individual needs. Last financial year, TAL paid $3.5 billion in claims to over 45,000 customers. Persons deciding whether to acquire or continue to hold life insurance issued by TAL should consider the relevant product disclosure statement. The target market determination for the product is also available online at tal.com.au. Welcome to episode three in our deep dive series into the world of insurance. My name is Sasha Ludkowski, and today we're focusing on claims. To help us understand the full breadth of the claims experience, I'm joined by two guests today. Our first guest is Alex Braun, Principal Advisor and owner of Holstead Financial Services. Alex got started in insurance in 1983, and Alex brings a wealth of knowledge to the insurance process and will be sharing his insights and experiences from the advice side of the fence. Our second guest is Andrew Morrison, General Manager of Retail Claims at TAL. Andrew has a long career in insurance, spanning claims and underwriting across the Australian, UK and European markets. Andrew will bring his expertise and experiences from the manufacturer side of claims, with a unique global lens. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Andrew, it'd be great to start with some high-level context of insurance claims in the Australian market. So what can you tell us about what trends you're seeing and whether the Australian market has any unique challenges? Um, well, let, let, let's start with the overall market. I think the Australian insurance industry and in, in the life side is around a $18 billion market. In terms of claims, just speaking of of what my company does, we paid out almost $3 billion in claims um, to individuals and their families. So what that means in context of the claims as a, as a whole in, in Australia is the impact we have on, on society, the amount of people that we're actually looking after via our products um, is significant and I think uh, is, a, is a great community benefit. In terms of what are we seeing in, in claims? There hasn't been a, a significant change over time other than perhaps a bit more, um, we see a bit more mental health coming through in our statistics. Um, but beyond that, I think it's fairly stable. The normal things, aches and breaks and hearts and cancers, those sorts of things, but that's why we're there and that's why we provide the cover that we do. In terms of globally, I don't think Australia is a little unique. We're, we're pretty heavy on providing income protection cover. That seems to be the, the main cover type, whereas on other markets, you'll see it being more term life um, and trauma type insurances as their lead products, and then then some income protection backing up behind that. And that generally is about the social structures in, in various countries, as well as the way those countries sort of work with insurance. Mm. That's that's interesting that income protection is, is, is more the focus or the, I guess, the product that appears to be coming through more on the claim. So Alex, from an advice point of view, I'd be keen to know if this reflects your experience. Where do your claims come from typically from both a medical and a, and a product point of view? Well, uh, look, I agree with Andrew and uh, I attend um, uh, an annual, obviously um, not during COVID, but uh, over the last uh, 25 years I've been uh, going to um, the United States and it's amazing. A lot of 
experienced ex advisors there and and indeed from all over the world this is an international conference some of them have no idea what income insurance is and as andrew said it's it's all life and trauma and um, we, when we advise people we look at everything because and people say well what what's important and and my answer is if 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 you were buying your 18 year old son his first second hand car and one one uh, one car had faulty brakes, the other one had faulty steering. Well, which of the two would you prefer to give him? And 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 the problem is that we don't know what happens in the next twenty years, so we need to cover everything. But people are more aware. Consumers are more aware of income insurance. They know what it is, and uh, and from a claims perspective, we we have a lot of. Uh, trauma as well as income insurance claims and uh, it's uh, sad if if uh, one of our, one of our clients gets sick and we've overlooked the uh, the question of uh, of certain products i had a dentist uh, client who who didn't buy life insurance but he bought income insurance and he was diagnosed with prostate cancer at the age of 45 on saturday and on on um, he was having his operation on Saturday, and on Monday they were set settling with a three million dollar investment property. And I was filling out, helping the uh, wife and the husband fill out the claim form on income insurance. And she said, "Alex, why didn't you sell my husband income uh, life insurance?" And I said, "Well, look, here's a, your file. Look at all the quotes that we've given you. Look at all the communications." And she looked at me. And she said, "But Alex, you're a salesman. You weren't persuasive enough." So maybe there's a lesson in that. <laughs> so let's talk then about the claims process. Um, you know, a lot of our advice community want to get more involved with insurance. And I think that claims can be quite an overwhelming experience for both advisors or advice professionals and also for the client, of course, because they're going through a medical experience. Um, so, Alex, I'd love if you could share with us how you coach clients through a claim. Um, what does the start look like? How do you get the client through? What expectations do you set with clients when when organising claims? It starts with the initial meeting because basically as an insurance advisor, an advisor specialising in, insur in insurance, indeed any financial advisor advising in any area of, of, of their expertise, uh, we spend a lot of time explaining how contracts work and what is important to them. What is the difference between a basic income insurance or with Tal and many other uh, providers, their premier contract, what is important, and making sure that there's constant contact with the client because you have conversations, a phone call, and things happen during the phone call. Things happen. You're, you're told uh, events which then end up being a claim. So what happens when there's a potential claim? Then we go back to the education process and we explain under what circumstances a claim may be paid. And the process is really embarrassingly basic. It's very basic. It involves returning calls on time making sure that a client doesn't have to chase you. It involves keeping promises. If you tell someone that you'll call them tomorrow with an answer and you're relying on someone else to give you that answer and you don't get that answer, let's still make the call. Mr. Client, I haven't got your answer, but you're not forgotten. And they need reassurance. And in a nutshell, it's managing expectations, keeping promises because during the claim process, or at the very beginning, clients under uh, they're, they're under immense stress. On one hand, they're wondering, well, what will be that blood result that's going to come out on Thursday afternoon? And in the meantime, who's going to? How am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to pay my children's education? There's a lot happening in a client's mind, and at the very least, we can transfer their anxiety in a small section of their brains. I, and, and it's a huge relief 
when I can pick up the phone and say, you'll be right with this claim, it will be paid. And that's a huge, huge relief on the part of the claimant. So I, I, I'm excellent, excellent information and all of that. I really like that, you know, first and foremost, we are educators. That's what, that's what we do. And, and this, this need for reassurance and, and some clients need more reassurance than others. But I think the consistent contact, the reassure, the reassurance is absolutely key. So Andrew, what about from the manufacturer's point of view? Um, you know, some of, some of our listeners may never have experienced an insurance claim. So what actually happens when a client calls up their advisor and then the advisor gets in contact with the manufacturer to start a claim? What's the process from, from the manufacturer's end? Um, let, let me talk about structure, how, how we structure it. So to try and make it as easy as possible for an advisor or a customer. So from our perspective, and, and many places I've worked, but I'll, I'll talk about TAL, it's, it's about having the right claims philosophy in place. So the right philosophy, from that, everything else flows. So our philosophy is um, customer and policyholder centric, right? And it's centered on providing anyone who needs to make a claim. Our approach will be fair, it'll be reasonable, it'll be efficient, and it'll also be clear. So we want everyone involved in that process to have confidence that their claim is being managed that way. So then, then from that philosophy, what we believe in is having really well-trained and expert staff who actually understand the dynamics of the business and the dynamics of how difficult a time it is for the individual when they're at claim stage. It's when people are at their most vulnerable. For us, whilst we always need to validate a claim, we're also needing to balance that with being sensitive to the individual needs of the customer. So claims philosophy first, well-trained staff second, then we'll start looking at the process. So we're acutely aware that a lot of advisors don't have that much experience in the claims process. So it can be quite daunting for them as well. So we've got a lot of things in place to help with that. So we've got dedicated business development managers that an advisor can call. They have relationships with already. Say, oh, help me out understanding this claims process. We also have claims consultants who I just said, they're really well trained. So they'll help the advisor understand what happens in the claim space, what the requirements are clear communication. So then what we do is set up our business that way. So for any claim, first time, we have a dedicated first contact team. So all you have to do is call them and say, I have a customer. If you're an advisor, I have a customer that needs to make a claim. Here's the policy number. Can you talk me through everything we need to do? And they do that. Then they'll send out a pack. And in that pack, again, it's very explanatory. Here's all the information we need. Get that completed, send it back to us so we can get that started. So it's, it's all about having that flow um, in a logical way. And as I say, right philosophy, well-trained staff, simple process in a difficult time. Now, I didn't stop you because all of that was gold. So oh, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's all really useful because like you said, like we know, there are lots of advisors who haven't had a lot of insurance claims or those claims are very sporadic. You know, it's kind of in a way unlucky if you're an advisor who has a lot of claims in a very short time. Um, so, you know, all of this information, I think it, it, it demystifies the process, which I think a lot of advice professionals love the exposure to. So... I guess in terms of, of Alex, your experience as an advisor, you know, we've talked about setting the expectation and, and being being the educators. Do you do this from the very first meeting with a client? So they've just come in your door to actually get insurance advice. How do you preface the fact that this is a long-term relationship, that you are going to be here for the long haul, and if things go wrong, you're here and this is how you help? Uh, unfortunately, what I've found in my meetings with uh, brand new clients, there, there's a great deal of uh, trust deficit. People have uh, bad news will appear on the first page. Good news, you know, when tell when tell uh, happens to pay a claim quickly, that doesn't appear on the front front pages. And 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 I I fully agree with what Andrew is saying. And I must say, as far as the process on on the insurance uh, side, the 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 actual process. Most companies are absolutely fantastic. I find that if I report a claim to most life officers within the next fifteen minutes, the claim pack goes out. 
and before I even a- attempt to answer your question, Sasha, I-, I-, I must say that that it's also common, not unusual, for a life office representative to telephone the client before a claim is formalized in order to get an understanding, well, is this really a claim? It may not be a claim. Why, why bother filling out fa- claim forms? It's a nuisance for the client. It's a, it's a nuisance for the life office uh, just to find out that you're not, you know, within, you, you've got depression. This is not a trauma claim. They will telephone you and that's perfectly within their right and, 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 and that's a normal process. From my perspective, I'll, I'll call the client and say, by the way, the life office is about to call you in the next few days. Don't be intimidated. Don't be afraid. There's nothing wrong. It is totally okay. This is what happens. I, I, if I talk about income insurance, uh, uh, because that's that's what I f- first talk about, most advisors talk about this is an income insurance that's going to potentially pay you $10,000 a month. And I don't talk about $10,000 a month. I tell my clients that hopefully you should be very lucky and you should be wasting all your money on insurance and never get sick. That'll be the best dollar that you'll ever spend. And you may even have one or two small claims along the way. You're 35 years old. This is a long-term contract. You're going to have this policy for a long time. But if you're unlucky and you sleep on that banana peel tomorrow at the age of 35, you've got 30 years worth of benefits cushioning you financially. And that means it's $10,000 multiplied by 12 multiplied by 30. And even with it, without indexation, that represents $3.7 million. With indexation, it's $4,500,000. So what you're spending your money on is potentially a $5 million benefit. And that's what we're talking about. And, and when it comes to life insurance, trauma insurance, we don't talk about the money because the income insurance will put a cushion under your ongoing expenses, but the life insurance or the trauma insurance will protect a person's family's lifestyle. And we talk about, is it important for Johnny to continue getting his piano lessons, his swimming lessons? Is it important for your wife to be able to make a decision and apply for a new job and not worry about losing her existing job. So we talk about what the insurance policy does rather than the lump sum. When you're buying a, 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 a when you're buying a drill, you don't need a drill, you need a hole. And <laughs> the insurance policy is the hole. So so we talk We've talked a little bit, it's it's come up in, in, in a couple of the answers so far, is all about this trust factor. Now, you know, typically it's it's been um, a highlighted fact from the consumer's point of view in the financial advice profession. So, and, and Andrew, you did touch on this in terms of TAL's process or a manufacturer's process when handling a claim. How does a manufacturer engender trust for clients in that claims process? Good question. So let's just talk about trust from a whole insurance perspective. I think the life insurance industry hasn't done a great job in um, separating ourselves from perceptions about insurers. Our claim payment rates across, you choose any product, life insurance, not from 98% above all claims are paid. IP, across the industry would it average around 95%. So these are claims acceptance rates. Uh, Trauma, between 88% and over 95%. So our statistics actually tell everybody that we can be trusted. So we haven't done a brilliant job in in actually getting that out to market. So we we don't walk into a claim thinking, or as a a manufacturer, we're not there thinking that we're not trusted because we actually know what we do. So I think the only thing we can do is maintain the processes and everything we have. They actually show statistically that we should be trusted. And the only only reason anyone should be concerned in a claim is potentially when they haven't told us something historically or while they're claiming. That's that's they're the only times it would be an issue. As I said, 
most claims are paid, statistically proven. We have now money smart websites that every individual and advisor can go on and compare the whole market. It does it every, I think they do the comparison every six months. So it's it's all there to see. So I, I'm a bit blind on that question, if it makes sense, because I, I have so much trust in what we do. I see how much statistically we pay out and I see the amount that we pay out and it all augurs well for us. Yeah, it's 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 so true. And, you know, you're exactly right in giving the actual statistics. And I mean, when I was an advisor, I had no qualms that claims wouldn't be paid out, especially if the facts were there. And really, it's a very factual experience. You either have a condition or you don't. Sometimes that can be a little bit more drawn out as we, as you know, evidence needs to be gathered and that sort of thing. But you're exactly right. The statistics tell everyone that we can be trusted. So then looking at it from the advice point of view, Alex, I can only speak from my own experience when I was an advisor, but the amount of clients who I'd say, hey, I Hey, you just told me during a renewal process, for an, for example, a renewal discussion, you've just told me that you had, you know, this condition in the last seven months. Um, have you considered that maybe we could make a claim for that? I'd be really interested in getting some more information from you and 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 seeing if that's a claimable event. Oh no, no they don't worry about it. No, insurers never pay out. Blah, blah, blah. What's the point of you holding this policy if you're not going to let me do the investigation? So, Alex, have you come up uh, against that? with your own client experience and then how do you help the client trust how do you help the client understand that this is going to be a process it's a very sort of factual experience how do you get that trust out of your clients i i do get uh, i do get statements well you know insurance companies never pay and i dispute it because i, I fully agree with andrew's uh, statistics and and those statistics are are proven it's they're, they're there but I keep my own statistics, and over the last 20 years, every time a claim payment has been made, and if it's an ongoing uh, income protection claim, there are 12 over a 12-month period, we actually photocopy, we, we get that email to us, we print it out, we put it into a, a, a physical file, obviously names are erased for privacy, and we have... Uh, six arch lever files, and I make sure I pull that out and I'll say, have a look. And this really eliminates any doubt because it really uh, it, 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 it really shows that the policies work. Now, as far as the question of um, uh, chatting, it's interesting what a telephone call does, what, what a... Uh, a marketer called Winston Marsh, who you probably have never heard of, he's been around for a long time, he calls them how-you-going hey, calls. When when you call up a client with for no reason, you're not trying to sell that client anything, you're not trying to get referrals, you just ask, how are you and how's your family? What's been happening to you? And uh, you, you might get different answers. I made such a call to a, to a um, bloke who, who who's a general practitioner, a, a, a doctor, and he said, look, thank God I'm okay. And I said, well, what happened to you? What do you mean you're okay? Well, I had an eye problem and I had a sore eye. I went to the ophthalmologist, but they turn turns out I had a stroke, but I didn't even know about it and I don't have any side effects or anything. And I said, well, you've got a, you, you don't have a trauma policy, but you do have a an income insurance with a specific illness benefit. Now, this gentleman had a high level of monthly benefit insured, he ended up getting $186,000 as a claim payment. So it's very seldom that a person who you're talking to who has a problem, they're all very happy to go through the... Uh, and I make it simple. I said, look, we're not going to make a, 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 a claim uh, application. Send me your... And this is my, my modus operandi. Send me your... Uh, medical uh, histology report. I'll send it into the claims department. They'll have a look at it and they'll tell you whether it's got legs or not. And and then we'll go on from there. And and I could tell you many stories, but I realize we've got limited time. But if you want to hear more, I've got lots more. Well, I'm sure they'll come up in the questions that I ask. And look, it's a really interesting point that you made. And I think this speaks to the whole insurance advice process is, is that 
you know, when I was an advisor, for example, honestly, so many of our claims, not necessarily the big ones, such as if a client passes away, because that's quite obvious, but so many of our claims came from things like the specific injury benefit, like the specific illness benefit. Now, for some of our, our newer listeners, newer advisors, some of those benefits just mentioned are no longer available on some of the current um, income protection contracts. But for legacy contracts, those benefits are still very relevant. And the number of times that I'd be having a a, a renewal discussion with a client, uh, which we did a standard in our business, everyone got a, a, a contact. Um, and then same sort of thing. How have you been? Oh, I broke my leg a few months ago, but it's all good. Didn't have any time off work. Let's let's talk about income protection because you you've got this benefit on your policy, and and that's what it's there for. Um, so yeah, it's 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 not just about the clients calling you in a reactive scenario. It's about being proactive in your insurance advice process. So Alex, what tips I guess do you have for other advice professionals in? getting on the front foot, being proactive around educating clients on 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 claims and and what the client's options are. A good question. and and from the very beginning, when I started at National Mutual Life in 1983, there was a lovely gentleman, his name was Murray Byrne, and he sadly is no longer alive. But he was a great advocate of income insurance. And one of the tips that I've learned from him early is to understand the contracts. And from then on, if you come into my office, I have every possible policy document. It it takes up a whole wall. And and you mentioned legacy products. And uh, uh, Andrew will know a company called Oceanic. Now, that's a legacy product that was purchased by... Uh, Asteron and Asteron was purchased by Tel. And just knowing those products and how they work, that's the first thing. I I suggest any and every advisor to scrutinize products because that, that will set you apart from, from your competition. You need to know your product. Uh, there was one instance, for example, that uh, someone was on claim on one of these legacy products and uh, and then I noticed that there, there was a 20% uh, uh, increase in the monthly benefit for the first three months of the claim. Now, the young administrator at the life office wasn't aware of it, but I was able to point it out to the person and, and it was promptly paid. And uh, guess what? That that held me in great stead with, with the client. So, so the important thing is to understand the products, understand it intimately, because that is that is our job, and create a good relationship with the indoor staff of the life offices. So if I get a, an email from, a, uh, from a, a claims representative, I always make sure that I respond to it, if, even if it's just a simple thank you. Thank you for your quick response, Marlene. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And... And better still, if you copy it into her supervisor, fantastic. So keep your relationship, maintain those relationships, enhance your relationships, and keep in touch with your clients. Make those telephone calls, the how you going telephone calls. Absolutely. And, you know, it is all of what we do is relationship management, whether it's with our clients, whether it's with our staff, Absolutely. whether it's with the life office. It, it is a relationship-based business, and anyone who thinks otherwise – you know, it is possibly going to have a tougher time than there needs to be in this profession. So, Andrew, we've talked about, you know, what the process looks like and and what advisors can experience from their end. What, I guess, tips or, or advice would you have for advisors and advice professionals in terms of um, helping a claim get through quickly from their end? What should they be providing as soon as possible? What What sort of things do you see there that can be helpful? It's, a, it's a, a relationship pretty much with three parties. So we have the advisor, we have the insured, and then we have the, the insurance company. And it's very important that we work together, all three of us. So what can happen, here's some advice. What can happen is if a advisor takes it over, you can sometimes, it, the communication can, it's like Chinese whispers, right? It can, by the time it leaves the, us to the advisor and then the advisor inter- interprets it and gets to the customer and then it comes back, it can become very clunky. 
So what I always talk about to my claims consultants as well as the advisors is work together, even have a, a conversation with the insured, the advisor on the phone call and the claims consultant. So all parties are clear. The best part about that is the clarity that we get. Now, if the advisors on top of it understands the claims process very clearly and has a great relationship with the insured, it becomes less important. But we find, because advisors haven't always had a lot of experience with claims, it works better if the three of us are always talking together. So that's, that's tip number one. Um, when we ask for something, often it's we're very clear about why. So sometimes we are, oh, why do you need that? Oh, this is just too much. If we're getting those question backs, it means that we're not explaining ourselves very well. But often we need the information. We're asking for the information because we need it to make that decision. We're not, we're not asking for superfluous information. It's to okay, give us that. We should be able to make a decision. Now, whether that's a positive, we're going to pay, as I say, very high percentage of pay. In the, in the, the moments where we don't pay, again, we'll explain very clearly why. So, so for example, trauma policies, not everyone's going to meet a definition. The definition-based policy. Do you have cancer as defined or not? Do you have, you mentioned a stroke earlier. There are definitions to those. Just the word itself doesn't mean a claim will be paid. But again, high percentage is suggesting they will be paid. Income protection. It's not a guarantee that you come on claim and you've got a benefit period to age 65 that's going to be paid to age 65. And we unashamedly say on income protection, our goal where possible is to get everyone back to work. We actually believe work is a good thing. Sometimes, and I say sometimes, rarely, the advisor and the insured might take that as, oh, you're just trying to get us off claim. It couldn't be further from the truth. We know how important work is in anyone's life. Now, whether that's even returning partially, you know, you might not get, ever get back to total, get back to partial. We may have an opportunity to get someone back into a different occupation. We've geared ourselves for all of this. We have so much support in the industry, I don't think it really matters what company you, you contact. We're geared unashamedly in income protection to try and get people back to work. If they can't, it's no problem. They will continue on claim. But sometimes I think we, we might suffer from trying to ha having that in our minds, you know, because we know, you know, sitting on claim is a pretty lonely business, to be fair. Um, you start to lose your contacts, the routine, your work colleagues. So staying work attached is quite an important thing holistically, let alone just on a claims basis. So just, just reflecting on the things that we offer advisors and their clients for when they're on claim. And it, you know, it depends on the product, right? But we, we've worked very hard in, in building out a whole range of services that we can assist people with. So we don't want to get in the middle of the individual and their treaters, so their own support and their treatment. But what we can do is help and engage with that. So for example, we offer things like cancer support. So if someone has a diagnosis, we can actually link them in with a team that actually can help them through the whole process and understand what it means to them. We've got rehabilitation teams so that they can work on physical health, exercise physiologists that can help build you back up. So that will sort of, it's an adjunct to your current treatment with your treaters. We've got all these programs in fatigue management, health coaching, pain management. We also have this one which I really like and it's really impressive is it's called Tal, Tal Health Connector. And what it does is we provide a resource where the individual can search all the community-based organizations that can help them with support through some of the medical conditions they may have, emotional support, assistance even with managing their finances and other, other things like that. So We've, we've worked really hard in, in looking at that. We've got mental health programs. We've got um, return to work programs. So I think in TAL specifically, we have a team of about 19 people dedicated to looking at those sorts of things amongst others. So whilst we have the, the claims assessment team, who will look at the claim and the policy and all that stuff. If we think there's an opportunity to help and on a broader basis, we have a number of programs additionally that will help with the advisor and the insured. That's excellent. And I think a lot of advisors, again, or advice professionals who haven't had a lot of experience in insurance claims might not even know that those services exist because, you know, we don't necessarily or advisors don't necessarily see that sort of stuff in a product disclosure statement or, you know, they might not hear about it because they don't talk to their business development manager a lot, all these sorts of things. So I think, That's right. That's right. yeah, we, we, actually, we have a very good website 
by the way. So yes, what is that? Want, uh, to to tal.com.au, not spruiking that at all. But <laughs> if most companies will have on their websites a claims process that'll outline it and then then all the other things, I think. Uh, but ours ours is pretty good and it's pretty self explanatory. So I'd, yeah. I'd recommend even even if you if your advisors don't have anything with Tal, have a look at it and then they can at least compare and contrast to where their business is held. I really loved the point that Andrew raised about Chinese whispers. Not that I love that, but in the sense that having a potential, you know, three-way call, getting clients, getting the insurer, getting everyone on the same side. Because I think that sometimes, not always, but sometimes we represent the clients. We can go into a, a an adversarial mode sometimes with insurers and, you know, it gear ourselves up for a fight, that sort of thing. Not always, but sometimes. And I think that if, again, advice professionals don't necessarily have a lot of exposure to, cl- to claims, that that can happen. So, Alex, have you ever facilitated calls like that yourself? Have you had that experience of poor communication versus great communication and how that's resolved a claim for you or anything like that? Look, I, I heard Andrew, Andrew's comments about Chinese whispers. I haven't experienced that. And uh, and uh, just as a side issue, Andrew mentioned uh, the, the fact that clients often question requirements. E.g., I, I often get the um, get the uh, comment from a client during a claim a income insurance claim process. Now hang on Alex, didn't you tell me that my policy is an agreed value contract and I don't have to provide financials in the event of a claim? And and of course we usually preempt that question by saying a lot of full claims, total disability claims, end up as partial disability claims. And in order to assess a partial disability claim, the life office requires financials in order to work out the relevant benefit while you're earning a limited income. So we, we rather than worry about Chinese uh, whispers, we, we prepare uh, and, and let the client know that this is totally normal. These are the reasons why. Now, I haven't had any issues there. However, there has been, there has been instances where certain companies, and it comes back to an individual rather than the company, but we fight for our clients, and, and and I come back to knowing the contract. If you know the contract, you've got something to fight with. If you don't know the contract, well, you know you're 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 wielding your sword in the dark, and you you're you're mainly hitting air. So I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, and I think you know there's there's a couple of things that are really pertinent there, and the first is knowing your contract. I do some work with professional year um, advisors. And that is one thing that I absolutely uh, share with them is know your contract. Don't leave it to your power planners, to your support staff to know the contract. Sometimes as an, you know, advisors, I think, um, do go and, and, and look and they're excellent at talking to clients, excellent at building relationships and can sometimes lack the technical skill. Uh, but it can't be undervalued. It can't be underrated enough. It's it's so important to really have a good understanding of of the contracts, both current and historical. I think another thing that that keeps coming through in in a lot of our discussions and this podcast series as a whole is the absolute importance and value on setting expectations throughout the entire process, start to finish, whether it's during a claim, whether it's setting up policies. Whether it's how you interact, you know what you what your clients can expect from a service point of view, and the ongoing education piece, expectations and education seem to be a recurring theme with this podcast series. So, taking a slight tack, slight different angle on this, I just wanted to spend the last couple of minutes just touching on your thoughts, Alex, on charging for claims. This is something that's starting to come up a little bit more now that. Um, you know, insurance commissions have changed and it, it costs more to service a client. What are your thoughts on charging for claims? And do you do it in your business? And is it something you've looked into? We only have one client who is paying us a retainer of $100 a month and we look after his claim. He is very grateful to us because his claim was originally rejected uh, 25 years ago. 
and he was 35 years old and he is a he was a uh, an accountant slash IT person he has suffered a stroke and he's on claim as we speak and he will be for the duration of the benefit period which is age 65 so he pays us a hundred dollars and he he just likes our company I dare say because he comes in once every three months now not every month once every three months he's, he's uh, and he he brings in his claim forms and we photocopy it for him. We give him a cup of coffee and two of his favorite biscuits. And we receive $100 a month, including GST, I must say. And he's our only client. And we've had lots and lots of claims. And we never charge for claims. In fact, I have had a number of uh, claimants referred to us who are not our clients. One was a pilot a 58-year-old Qantas international pilot who was referred to us by his uh, by his uh, medical uh, general practitioner, doctor, who is a client and a friend. And um, I handled his his uh, trauma claim. We, When I say I, I've got two children in the business, Sandra, who's a chartered accountant by a previous occupation, and, and David, and have been with me for a long time. And our, our business is long-term business. And we looked after this person. And I went to his home in Cheltenham, which is, what, 20 minutes drive away from. And I've been there several times. And then he pulled out his checkbook the fourth time I came to help him fill out claims and explain things to him. Alex, we've never seen an invoice from you. I said, what do I owe you? And I said, you don't owe me anything. I'm happy to help. This business has been very good to me. And I'm more than happy to help. And he, he just was amazed. And he said, is there anything that, that, that I can do for you? I said, well, as a matter of fact, yes, you, you can. Yes. If, if that's your question, the answer is yes. Well, what is it that I can do for you? I said, look, I'd like to meet some of your fellow uh, Qantas pilots and some of your friends and some of your family members. May I come back in three weeks' time? And by that time, you'll be able to look through your telephone book. And I did come back. And he had 23 Qantas pilots with mobile numbers for me. Now, to me, that's better than a $300 payment. It's an interesting it's an interesting way to look at it, that's for sure, because I think that there's, there's a great case for charging for claims as long as the expectation is set up front as you take on the client, the expectation must be set for that to work. At the same time, there is also an excellent opportunity to use claims as an opportunity for referrals. Um, and it's 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 an easy way to get referrals. Unfortunately, it it is never a, a nice thing to for the client to experience on the first, you know, making a claim. But if it's a successful claim, which we've seen in today's discussion that many, many claims are successful, then it, it is an excellent opportunity to ask for so, referrals. So there's nothing at all wrong uh, with charging a fee. I, I'm happy not to. Remember also, most of my claims are my own clients, and I figure that I've been receiving commissions for a relatively minimal amount of work over many, many years. So I have a, a moral obligation to assist them at this particular time, and I'm happy to do that without a fee. But horses for courses, every every situation is different, obviously. And you're exactly right. And I think Andrew mentioned the word philosophy earlier in our conversation, yes. and I think it just comes down to each individual advice practice's philosophy and each individual case. There is a case for claim fees. Sometimes there isn't necessarily a case. So I think you're exactly right. Horses, for courses, philosophy, whatever you want to call it. So right. look, let's let's round out our conversation. It's been excellent to to have both of you on here and get the the, the point of view from the advice uh, side of, of the world and also from the manufacturer's point of view. And I think that three key things keep kept coming up for me during this podcast. And they were the words expectations, process, and education. And that's what in a lot of cases, claims comes down to. So, Andrew and Alex, thank you very much for your time today. It's been instructive, and I'm sure our listeners have got a lot out of it. Uh, now, our listeners can find you both on LinkedIn, I'm guessing, uh, yes. so they can reach out to you both there. But thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you got some value out of today's podcast. Thank you, Sasha, and thank you, Ensemble. <laughs>